Let's imagine that our code was made up of these six parts arranged in a column as shown. These parts are not isolated from one another, of course. They interact with each other through function calls. How does the total number of interactions grow as the number of parts, call it n, grows? Each part has n other parts, including itself, to interact with. And you have to multiply this n by another n because we don't just want the number of interactions by one part, we want the total. So while the number of parts, by definition, grows linearly with the size of your code, the interactions between these parts grows quadratically. So it's the interactions that we need to worry about. The point I want to make here is that for software development to remain tractable as your code grows, we need to avoid having to rewrite these interactions every time a part of the code is changed. We achieve this by having each part sign a contract promising to interact with the other parts in a fixed way. We can then make changes to the part as we please, and as long as the changes don't break the contract, the overall code will not break. These contracts are called interfaces. An interface facilitates interactions between two parts of the code, similar to how a universal joint facilitates interactions between two shafts. The universal joint allows the shafts to interact even if misaligned as long as the misalignment meets certain conditions, the one spelled out in a contract in the case of interfaces. If this interface idea really works, it would allow us to convert software development from a big O of n squared to a big O of n. Now, some of you might laugh at this thinking that I'm dramatizing the role of interfaces here. I'm not, I'm just being honest. They really are that important, assuming their work is described. Now, spoiler alert here. They will come very close to getting the job done as described, but there will be one outstanding issue. Then in the final act, something called dependency injection will sweep in and give interfaces the push they need to finish the job. You, on the other hand, the viewer, do not need to wait until the final act to sweep in and hit the like and subscribe buttons, assuming you're enjoying the content. At this point, we're left with three questions. What does it mean to specify conditions for interaction between different parts of our code? What does it mean to collect these conditions in contracts? And how exactly do we get a part of our code to sign such contracts? Let's start with specifying conditions for interaction. First, let's clarify that when we say a part of our code, we specifically mean a class, because that's what classes are. We create classes when we collect code together that serves a common purpose. Let's also remember that the overarching goal here is to not have to rewrite the interactions between our classes every time we make a change to a class. How do classes interact? They interact through method calls. What constitutes a method call? That would be the method name, input arguments, input types, and output type. In other words, the method signature. So we want to be able to freely make changes to classes as long as these changes do not touch the method signatures. That's all there is to it. Specifying conditions for interaction is therefore done by specifying method signatures. Now let's consider what is meant by collecting conditions in a contract. We've already explained that we specify conditions by specifying method signatures. So we collect conditions in a contract by simply collecting method signatures in a file. This will already sound familiar to many of you, because in C++, we're constantly in the habit of collecting method signatures in files. Such files are called header files. I will link to a previous video on header files in the top right corner as well as in the description section. Now typically when creating a header file, we create it for a class and it will be no different in this case. In fact, interfaces in C++ are nothing more than classes. There is no interface keyword. The good old class keyword will do. The main difference is that we will skip creating the corresponding .cpp file because we want our interface class to only specify method signatures and do not wish it to specify method implementations. The last question we have is how to get a class to sign a contract meaning how do we promise the compiler that a class will have all the methods of an interface class? Again, we luck out because there's already a way to do this in C++. We simply have our class inherit the interface class. Now you might be thinking the interface class does not define any method implementations, only method signatures. So what is there to inherit exactly? Well, when you inherit a method signature, you basically inherit the obligation to define an implementation for this method. Let's look at a real world example. Say we want to drive a robot in our main.cpp file based on the robot's GPS coordinates. So in a drive function in main.cpp, we will have to call methods of a GPS class, such as say get latitude and get longitude. 
This GPS class lives outside of main.cpp, but they interact through its method calls. Now during the course of development, we expect we'll want to try out different GPS classes. So we don't want to be tied all the time to a single GPS class. Visually, imagine that the new GPS class may have deeper grooves, which would require us to modify main.cpp to have deeper teeth so the two fit together. I want to motivate why we'd want to avoid having to make such modifications to main.cpp every time we switch to a new GPS class. The first reason is that main.cpp simply contains the logic for driving the robot based on latitude and longitude values. It has nothing to do with how we obtain these values, what GPS hardware we use, how the GPS class was written, or even whether we use a mock GPS class that makes up these values out of thin air. The code in main.cpp should run exactly the same regardless. So that's one reason. Now you may be thinking, what are the chances I'll have to switch to a new GPS class anyways? And in the off chance that happens once, I can live with the fact that I'll have to update main.cpp accordingly. First of all, in a real-world scenario, we may have several files making use of the GPS class, not just main.cpp. And this will be true not just for the GPS device, but also for the motion sensor, the electronic speed controller, and on and on and on. Also, we'll definitely repeatedly swap out the GPS class during testing. In fact, testing introduces an entirely new incentive for keeping main.cpp fixed during these switches. One might even say that testing presents the true motivation for interfaces and dependency injection, and that the reduction in development complexity from a big O of n squared to a big O of n is just an added bonus. So let's take a closer look at testing. As challenging as software development can be, software is always infinitely more predictable than hardware. So we want to do as much testing as possible through simulations before heading out into the real world where the sky is the limit in terms of what can go wrong. The more we can isolate our code from the outside world and all its chaos, the more we'll be able to test through simulation. Code contained in main.cpp interacts with the outside world only indirectly through its interaction with the GPS class. To fully isolate main.cpp from the outside world, we can replace the GPS class with a mock GPS class that generates mock latitude and longitude values, meaning values that are not obtained through real-world measurements. Now let's say that main.cpp is a smashing success during simulation. It performs exactly as expected. But let's say that when switching from the mock GPS class to the real GPS class, we were forced to edit main.cpp to reflect the change. Are we still assured that main.cpp will perform flawlessly in real-world tests? It performed flawlessly during simulations, yes, but that was a different main.cpp. We were forced to edit it. So if we're no longer sure that it will perform flawlessly, what was the point of the simulations? We have here an entirely new motivation for interfaces and dependency injection. To be able to perform unit testing, as it's called, we need to completely avoid having to edit main.cpp when switching the GPS class. All right, enough motivation. Let's get to work. We'll start by creating a mock GPS class and a real GPS class. We create each of these classes, of course, by creating a pair of header and CPP files. Please check my video on header files linked in the top right corner as well as in the description section below. Luckily for us, Visual Studio has automated the process of creating these file pairs. Now we want both of these classes to sign the same contract promising to implement the same method signatures for get latitude and get longitude. So let's create this contract. We'll call it IGPS, the I indicating that it is an interface. Remember a contract or an interface is just a class without the CPP file, meaning just the header file. So we'll delete the CPP file portion of this class. The contract spells out the method signatures for get latitude and get longitude. But we want to make it clear from the outset that these methods must be implemented by classes that sign the contract, meaning classes that inherit from this IGPS class. We do this by declaring these methods as quote unquote pure virtuals. The syntax for this is the virtual keyword placed at the start of the declaration and then equals zero at the end. There, this is now as proper an interface as you can get in C++. 
Now let's get the Mod GPS and Real GPS classes to sign the contract by inheriting iGPS. After signing the contract, these classes now have to deliver on their obligation to implement the interface methods. And here again, Visual Studio helps us out with a nice automation. It even gives us a peek into the default implementation it's created in the CPP file. You can scroll down to see that both methods are now implemented in realgps.cpp. We'll do the same, of course, with the mock GPS class. To keep this video short, they'll both generate mock coordinates. We'll just have to imagine that one is mock and the other is real. Right now, both of these classes return the same values, namely zero for everything. Let's edit these implementations so that they return distinguishable coordinates. Let's have the mock return 11.3 and real GPS return 2.5 so that we can tell them apart. Now main.cpp can interact with either of these classes through the iGPS interface. There we create a drive robot function that takes an iGPS reference and uses it to read out latitude and longitude coordinates. Please see my video on pointers and references in C++ linked in the top right corner as well as in the description section below. Now one important point to make about interface classes in C++ is that we cannot create an iGPS class instance. We can only create iGPS pointers or references. This is perfectly fine because we want to use the interface as a middleman to instances of other classes, in this case instances of the mock GPS or real GPS classes. So we can create an instance of say mock GPS and pass that instance to the dry robot function. Let's compile and run to see that all works as expected and we get 11.3 which means we're certainly interacting with the mock GPS object through the iGPS interface. To switch to the real GPS class, we just add the respective include statement and switch to real GPS on this line of code. Compile and run again to see that we are indeed now interacting with the real GPS object through the iGPS class. Great, we've managed to completely separate the logic in the drive robot function from our choice of GPS class. There's one small problem though, and that is that we would still have to edit this line of code right here in main.cpp, as well as potentially the include statements at the top of main.cpp every time we swap out the GPS class. Now you might be thinking, well, how else would the computer know which class we want to use? We have to tell it somewhere. That's right, but main.cpp is not the right place. This is where dependency injection comes in. We need to be able to specify all class implementations, meaning not just our choice of GPS class, but also our choice of motion sensor class, electronic speed controller class, etc. All in one place. Similar to how you might specify all setting parameters in a single settings or configuration file. Except that in this case, you're not just setting parameter values, you're setting class implementations. You've leveled up in your programming career. Congratulations. So let's create a config class where we'll make all these choices. In this config class, we'll create a getGPS method that returns an iGPS reference to a private GPS member. We configure the GPS class implementation when declaring the private GPS member. If choosing to use, say, the mock GPS class, we declare the private member as a mock GPS type. We can now delete all mentions of the two class implementations, mockGPS and realGPS, from main.cpp. Main.cpp can now simply call the getGPS method of the config class to get the iGPS reference that it needs for the drive robot function. 